Hey, thank hey. you, Zoe. And uh, thank you to our sponsor, HZO. Next up is our final session of the day, a panel discussion titled Engineering at the Intelligent Edge, Smarter, Faster, Smaller, with Dustin C2, Dan Linstead, Brad Hoffert, and Ken Wada, moderated by Matt. So take it away, Matt. Very good, thank you. Um, well, anyway, the focus is here on engineering at the intelligent edge, which implies things like putting AI close to the edge or actually just beyond the edge. Maybe it's not a connected device. So it struck me that it might be useful to the panel at least and myself to know what you in the audience think uh, of, uh, or sorry, what you in the audience have done in this direction. So uh, what I'd like to do is, Jillian, if you can post our polling question, and that would be really helpful. And it says for you to pick, there's a little radio dot. Um, so it goes from, you know, you've already done a lot of this all the way down to, I don't even know what you're talking about. So if you can pick one of those, I'll give you about uh, five seconds to answer. Um, some people just have research, some people are active, some people, okay, wow, um, is that really, let's see, okay, go ahead, Jillian, show me the results, uh, when you, you feel like it's, is it really split that evenly, okay, <laughs> that, that doesn't, that doesn't sound, um, like a, maybe <laughs> it really is what happened, um, no, I believe it. Do we need a ref do we need a refresh on that, or is that really nope. the result? That recount. Yeah. yeah. Recount. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's do a let's do another try, just for the heck of it. It's worth it, I think. Um, so pick your pick your thing, and I'll wait three or four seconds. There, that looks better. Do you want to post those results, Jillian? Please. Okay, uh, there it is. So a large number of you, not the majority, that says uh, we have designs and deployments underway. Uh, nearly a quarter of you say we have active research. 14% uh, we don't have any research projects devoted to intelligent edge designs. And actually another 14% said I don't know what you're talking about. So. Um, that proves that it's worth keeping this a well-rounded discussion. <laughs> so here's the first uh, question for all of us. Uh, let's go in this order, if you guys wouldn't mind, um, and uh, just take a minute to tell your name, title, and role at your company, and maybe quickly describe your experience in dealing with edge devices. Um, so starting with Brad, then Ken, then Dan, then Dustin, if that's okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Brad. All right. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, right. I can. Um, well, in my background, I'm the president and uh, co-founder of Loco Labs. Uh, we're a product design company in Silicon Valley. Um, we design lots of uh, IoT and uh, edge-based products over the years. And I think the you know the important thing about you know what you know, some some recent uh, things that we've been working on, an edge device for commercial buildings um, and traffic boxes. Um, so very interesting application. But a lot of it has to do with, you know, the reliability, obviously, but also what's the software stack? That's really important. And, uh, you know, what's the server architecture? Um, what are you trying to reproduce in on the edge? And uh, other examples are, uh, a mask monitor, something that monitors a respirator uh, real time, um, kind of thing you don't want to send all that gob of data somewhere. Nobody really cares, you know, how many times somebody breathed in or breathed out, but you want to know what's it, what's interesting, what's important about it. And it's also one of those kind of applications that's extremely battery sensitive. So um, excited to be on the panel today and looking forward to uh, Lots of cool discussion. Okay, Ken, thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ken Wada. 
I am uh, president and CEO of REM Technologies. Um, for the past, over the past 25 years, I've developed products for automation and broadband networking uh, industries. So when you combine the two, uh, it is all about connectivity. Um, currently, I'm in the process, uh, actually for the last couple of years, uh, I'm also the CEO of a startup uh, that is dealing with uh, interconnectivity and transparency and visibility with operations. It's in stealth mode right now. Uh, we have a few customers uh, and we have a couple patents. The, our main patent is on uh, uh, bringing uh, 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 self-forming uh, self -forming, uh, networks into the application space. The, the reason for doing this is because when we talk to uh, operations managers throughout the world, the uh, final frontier or the next frontier of the application space is we're going to be creating many, many varieties of applications. So quickly cut, cutting one application into uh, uh, gross units of 10 million units per year kind of thing is not going to happen in the industry. So what people really want is to get transparency and visibility amongst all their edge devices today. And uh, they want to use a combination of uh, uh, their uh, localized servers, cloud servers, and whatever resources they can bear. Uh, as uh, our HCO uh, sponsor has correctly stated, uh, minimizing downtime is one of the key metrics, uh, key performance indicators uh, that is currently being used. And in a lot of cases, uh, with this lack of visibility, uh, we're failing miserable. So th there needs to be a technological solution to this. And, and by the way, today, uh, connectivity is not just uh, hanging an Ethernet cable or Wi-Fi connection. It means handling the data model and all that. And the problem with that is it's taking an exponentially growing army of software engineers and developers to handcraft all these connections. Okay, so there needs to be a technology that provides a, a means for the applications themselves to self-form these data pathways and then uh, and establish uh, data models at real time. And uh, that's basically one of the biggest challenges facing this industry today. So, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Okay, Dan. Yes, hello. So my name is Daniel Lindstedt. Uh, I work as an optoelectronics and sensor expert engineer at Sigma Connectivity here in Sweden. And I'm also leading a cross-disciplinary team on sensors. So Sigma Connectivity is an engineering and design house, meaning we do not develop our own products, but rather take on product development and products uh, from our customers. And the connectivity in the name comes from our background in the mobile phone industry. And we still do develop phones from time to time, but now we apply this experience to any type of connected device or radio technology enabled device. So today we meet a lot of interesting customers all over the world who are perhaps not very knowledgeable in IT technology or edge devices. And these customers often present a very open question like, I would like to detect when this happens and take some action on that. So. Then we discuss with the customer and take the full responsibility and develop a complete product to suit those needs. So my responsibility is always from the perspective of the sensor system integration. And I will cover things like sensor physics, stuff like power consumption and, and yeah, develop the whole product. Very good. Thank you, Dan. And Dustin, finally. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, so first off, uh, I do want to say thank you to Fierce Electronics, uh, the host, and yourself moderating this event. I think there was a lot of good thought leadership and discussion. So thank you also for all the participants for joining, um, especially during this time, right? During a global pandemic, uh, unprecedented, um, we really can showcase how technology is helping a lot of us continue with our daily operations, daily lives, uh, working from home. But that is really heavily you know, adjusted to what we know as the cloud model. So if you were to look at the overall technology technology trend, right, the cloud model has kind of been hyped for the last maybe 10 years about how technology delivering solutions on premise, you know, hybrid model. Um, but to Ken's point where there needs to be a change of technology, I don't believe there is going to be a silver bullet, uh, so to speak. I really believe it's a hybrid model. And there's this constant juxtaposition between both 
um, leveraging data in the cloud also versus edge computing. And I really truly believe there's a hybrid model and edge as a whole is so broad. Um, so just to kind of hone in on premium and where we land in terms of our overall solutions, uh, we define the edge uh, as the rugged edge. Uh, we understand that there are certain elements of the edge that re require reliability, require mission critical um, operations 24 seven. So how we do that is we really commit to a robust platform, a robust roadmap that really leverages key pillars in terms of what our product defines in compute. So specifically, you know, where the market is go growing and why edge computing as a whole has built so much hype. Um, and what I like to call is kind of like a, a sexy makeover of embedded computing, right? Because embedded computing for the last 15, 20 years has kind of flown under the radar. But now as we move into edge computing, um, like, a, like one of the keynotes was saying was specifically, right? There's a lot of these people who are trying to deploy solutions or design solutions in areas where they've never had experience. And that's what really Premio comes in. You know, for the last 30 plus years, we have over 300 employees, 150 of employees are electronics engineers, mechanical engineers, system reliable, uh, reliability engineers, you know, EMI specifically. So we take all those key elements of what a, a rugged edge computer needs to define. And we really deploy that into a lot of these new, new applications. So specifically, you know, a lot of robotics, industrial automation, vehicle telematics, right? Autonomous commercial trucking, right? You have all these uh, commercial yeah. trucking manufacturers, traditionally what they're only good at was manufacturing an engine and a truck. Now they're trying to move all this technology and all these sensor data into a, a solidified platform to not only you know take the analytics out of that, but really deliver changes in um, intelligent results, right? So ne the next point to that is, you know, what what is the intelligent side of it and what's driving that intelligence and the elephant in the room. So I think you know most of the panel will probably agree. Um, we're not at artificial intelligence any like currently. I don't like to say we're at artificial intelligence. What we're really at is a machine learning model. And that machine machine learning model is really driving based on a lot of these key pillars of technology from you know x86 compute, ARM, uh, 5G connectivity, computer vision, all being able to process the sensory data, take cognitive cognitive. Uh, intelligence and literally drive a better business business decision for a lot of these major companies. So that's wow. where we're in the place. Well, wow, thanks, Dustin. Uh, I think you really, uh, really described sufficiently how broad the subject matter is. And, uh, you know, I kind of have to apologize because it is so broad and it's hard to talk about it in such a short space of time. On the other hand, uh, it seems like we can sort of dive in so I, I picked this as another question to pose to all of you. And if we could go around in the same order and answer, um, can you describe how low power for edge devices can lead to choices and trade-offs? Um, and I think you hinted at it uh, there, Dustin, you know, the connectivity might not really be uh, to the cloud. It might be a hybrid and maybe that when you, it's your time, you can describe that. So uh, if we could start again with Brad to that question, please. Yeah, um, I think that what we've been seeing is a, uh, a real change in how, how data is processed as, as, as everyone's pointing out. It's, it's processed, it has to be processed at the edge because there's just so much of it. And a good example um, is this uh, this mask uh, monitor that we are developing, and that requires you know temperature sensors, humidity, um, pressure, <clears throat> and uh, uh, gyros, and a lot of other you know microphones, uh, lots of sensors, sensor information. So this thing needs to work all day. Um, while somebody's at work and it needs to not be obtrusive. So how do you do that? What's what's the right uh, mechanism? It also has to never lose data that's supposed to be transmitted to the cloud. And so it has to have storage, it has to have uh, battery, it has to have battery monitoring, it has to have um, uh, network connectivity, but that has to be efficient. Um, so you look at all of these different parameters and. You know, it's basically all the requirements, right? You know, it all starts from the requirements for your project. 
And you know, we take on a lot of projects uh, similar to Daniel. Um, that's what we do. And so this particular project has been really interesting in the sense of it's marrying all these things together. There's there's AI, there's uh, machine machine learning, <clears throat> and uh, so we have to um, look at every aspect of every sensor and say, okay, what is the frequency I want to hit this thing at? Um, because I'd love to have infinite resolution, but that goes against batteries, battery life. These sensors typically uh, burn a lot of power when you, when you want them to run at their highest uh, sample rate. And so you're always balancing, you know, how much, how much data is it good enough? How much is enough for me to, um, to actually process the information I need and actually get the answers that I need. Um, the interesting thing is when you're using machine learning is in the early days, you don't know. You're, you're building huge data sets and it's, it's about building up massive data sets. You don't know exactly what data is going to be valuable and at what resolution. And so you have to go through this, this early phase where we have large batteries and, and uh, uh, we can turn everything on at full speed so that we can analyze all that data and then build the, um, the inference engine um, and run the data through it. And then, then we know what the end product requirements are going to be for, for power, for instance. So that's one example of you know, how you have to balance everything and you don't know all the answers up front. So there's some so, experimentation right, that has to happen. Yeah, so before I pass it on to Ken, um, I mean, in the example of the mask, I mean, is the inference engine there right in the mask? Yeah, yeah, it has to be because you can't yeah. send that much data over battery powered device um, for eight hours. Yeah. <clears throat> One just for the sheer power of sending the data over a, over a network, you've got to compress it down. Um, and instead of trying to compress the data, you're much better off actually processing the data on the edge so that you're getting answers like, you know, is the person healthy? You know, are, are they breathing at a normal rate? Um, you know, are there any pathogens? There's other sensors in there to, to, man, to uh, monitor the air quality. Um, you don't need air quality data every second, right? You need air quality data every minute or so. And okay. you know you only need to know if it's changed, that type of thing. That's a big, big task. All right. Well, if you can join us, Ken, and with your explanation. Yes. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of the projects that I work on, uh, power generally doesn't seem to be an issue. However, uh, uh, what is typically required is that uh, when uh, power is cut off to the system, it simply it has to continue working. So to that end, we, there's typically like a rechargeable battery on the system and a battery and a power and health indicator. Uh, most of the issues that uh, we're confronted with uh, on our projects are uh, with um, the connectivity part that it just simply does not make sense to route up, you know, several SPI or I squared C sensors, you know, from a point of use to some just uh, central hub and then send that off to cloud. Uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons why you cannot support a thing like that from everything from an aquaculture pond to a factory floor. It, it's just untenable to rig up that kind of wiring. So what people are doing is they're putting uh, because microprocessors and memory have become much, much lower in cost, they're pushing these devices closer and closer to the point of use. So let, let me uh, to speak a little bit because the previous uh, speaker brings out some very, very good points uh, for an embedded, any embedded systems designer. Uh, one of the most critical, critical uh, parts of the system that you must consider is um, this choice in uh, the trade-offs and the balance between what I call pre-processing and post-processing. Okay, pre-processing is like collecting sensor data and then digitizing it and then storing it, caching it, and make, generating logs, okay? Uh, yes, of course, uh, that's the heart and soul of about any system. And then the other part of uh, what could be considered pre-processing is 
if you got a feedback loop. In other words, uh, you got a process going on. For example, you're measuring temperature, you're uh, sending a, a pulse density signal to, uh, to an actuator, and it's closing the loop and it's controlling temperature. That that's still in my mind. Uh, that's still pre-processed uh, pre -processed data. He's doing something very specific. What most customers are very, very keen on is uh, two things. It's mostly post-processed data. Uh, the, the biggest request I get is for alarms. Uh, alarms and events, uh, being able to capture them. And, uh, and I'm not just talking uh, like, you know, say, if an alarm comes in and then it goes away, you know, it doesn't do anything for our customers, okay? So they're gonna want uh, to see uh, alarm latches that could be cleared by the customers. They wanna see essentially when things that are critical to their processes and operations, when they're happening, they, they really want actionable information. Okay, then the second part of post-processing is taking the, the data that's coming into this uh, small device and doing some preconditioning and, and, and post-processing of it so that it can generate some aggregate information that may be of use to the customer. Again, just like alarms, uh, these systems are very, very application specific. So I tell my developers and I tell everybody out there who's interested in developing products like this, the more if you could uh, create a platform or software platform that can handle events, alarms, and uh, post-processing, then you're going to be way ahead of the game. Uh, and your products are going to, and it's not necessarily, we're, I'm not talking about uh, selling better, but what you're doing is you're offering a, a solution that makes your customers happy. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. Okay, so I'll, I'll lead on to the next speaker. Okay, Dan, go ahead. Okay, so... It sounds like uh, Brad is doing a lot of similar stuff that uh, we're doing at our site. So <clears throat> I had very similar thoughts, um, but one to put it in more in, in real life experiences. We get a lot of these reoccurring discussions that <clears throat> where to draw the separating line on edge computing or cloud computing. And a lot of customers, when they're new to this, they just say, just send all the raw data and to our cloud and we'll analyze it there. Um, but we find that we often have to do, we have done many times, power budget and data bandwidth budget to simply show what it means and to, to make the battery last as long as it means. And one example we had was a, a wearable device that had a very small battery, but also an IMU like accelerometer, gyro magnetometer and a bunch of other sensors and the radius used was Bluetooth Low Energy, and the customer thought they needed this data rate at 200 hertz, uh, but that amount of data in raw format from these sensors is simply cannot be handled by Bluetooth Low Energy, even if the link is perfectly optimal. So we had to use a lot of edge algorithms to do these calculations and get like quaternions and get the rate, data rate down to about 50 hertz. So today, this is this was about five years ago, and today this is more or less standard. A lot of the IMU suppliers has these functions built in, which is, of course, very good. Um, another example I remember is a case of human presence detection, where we could reduce the amount of data transmissions over the radio to vastly improve the battery life by just introducing a few clever algorithms that could eliminate false positives and then only send the correct data because this device was intended to be on a coin cell battery for at least five years. Um, so my takeaway is to do the budget on power and data bandwidth and then take very it from there. Good. Yeah, thanks for the specific examples. Uh, very interesting. Um, Dustin. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I want to go back to Ken's point. I think he made a very good uh, topic that we can kind of dive deeper into, and it's the element of really understand the application workload, uh, but specifically understanding where the level of pre-processing and post-processing needs to happen. So I remember, right, uh, when IoT was first, you know, being discussed and there was a big hype about it 10 to 15 years ago, um, we understood that there was these things and these things had a lot of data. And that those things and there's data really transformed into what we knew as the next step as the big data aggregation, right? So everyone was talking about big data, everyone knew they had to aggregate all this data, but the problem there was 
they just collected all this data and didn't really turn it to any actionable insight. So what I call at that time is that they were just taking all these dumb data sensors. Um, but the main challenge at that time specifically was to really drive uh, the interoperability and really the connection of legacy and pre uh, pre predecessor computing components and really driving that into like, large storage capacities. But I think going through that path and a lot of these enterprise companies and going through that path and learning from that has driven into where we are now in the market. And that's where big data is now driving a lot of this machine learning and the future of artificial intelligence, right? So um, now that you have this data and you're pulling that into a pre-processing standpoint, right? What do you want to do with that data? Maybe you do a little bit of a, a computational algorithm sequential. Um, but where Premio is comes into the picture and where we're starting to see a lot of customers do that is that post-processing uh, specifically. And that post-processing is taking that data and putting enough uh, compute power closer to where data is generated uh, through a lot of machine learning. And, and from, a, from a technology and from a technical standpoint, um, in the embedded space, what's really driving a lot of this uh, machine learning is really based on parallelized compute, whether that be through your, your PC or PCIe GPUs and then and also even into a lot of this NVMe high performance storage, right? Everything that's within that box, all that performance that's local to where the data is generated can drive, uh, can run these uh, machine learning algorithms specifically. Another big challenge, um, right, that's in post-processing that no one really addressed is it doesn't really matter what happens in the box, right? Um, you know, servers have been doing high performance in data centers and controlled environments for ages. So that's all controlled inside the box. What we really strive to do is we create a balance. And when I talk about balance, it's really into the embedded architecture of how you move the data, how you get the uh, force, you know, specifically for the application, but now moving that to a, a pipe or a data bandwidth that can deliver into specifically the cloud, right? So with the next evolving wireless connectivities, you have Wi-Fi 6 coming into play. You now have uh, 5G, you know, on the horizon. Um, you can actually take a lot of this you know, high speed bandwidth and really uh, move it into uh, what I call ultra low latency uh, connections. And when there's low latency, uh, data can move back and forth between whether that be at the core, all the way to the edge, all the way out to the cloud, right? Um, so kind of to give an example of you know, that trade off and, and a specific product realization that we came from um, and being in the embedded industry specifically, um, you know, low power consumption and efficiency is the sandbox that we play into. So most of all our, you know, uh, product designs, working with our engineers are really focused in rugged designs, but specifically industrial grade reliability. So everything from our thermal engineering, right? We need to make sure uh, some of our computing products are all fanless designs because when it's passively cooled, you have ultra reliable, ultra reliability, um, specifically for a lot of these harsh environments. In addition to that, you have a lot of shock and vibration. Uh, humidity, uh, you know, low power voltages. So being uh, being able to deploy a box where there might as be um, a stable power and still deliver uh, mission critical reliability is, is extremely important. So um, another another point that I wanted to make is that you know a lot of the people rushed to the market for the edge computing demand, and they really came up with products just to kind of meet what people said they thought they needed, right? But really what we did was we took a step back and we really kind of took all these market feedback and really came up with a solution. And that solution being an AI inference computer, right? So a lot of these, a lot of these early uh, market solutions really put as much GPU power, you know, four or five GPUs at the edge, but the biggest trade-off that they didn't really understand was that power problem, right? So being able to really understand and deliver not only a, a, you know, a power efficient box, but you were no, were not, were no, were no longer able to deliver that in a, a family solution. But in, in, uh, in some of the resources that you'll see kind of in this tab, um, you know, we, we basically moved a pretty powerful GPU also with a hot swap NVMe M.2 storage for that high non-persistent memory and with a 10 gig connection out. So this box, whether that it's, you know, pre-processing, post-processing, has enough horsepower to compute that data, run the machine learning algorithms, and communicate back and forth with the cloud. Uh, yeah, thanks. Very good. I'm uh, eager to see if anybody in the audience would like to pose a question, and you do that on the left side of your screen. Um, or you could put it in the chat, but it's easier to find if you put it under the Q&A column. Um, and then I'm going to invite Zolt and James back in for answering questions. Uh, I think uh, there's probably some questions from earlier sessions as well, but 
and you know, I'm going to give a priority to the questions out of uh, this panel. Um, let me ask, uh, just you know, continuing on with what we just heard, uh, it strikes me that if you're doing inference work right at a device, like a mask, or uh, let's say it's uh, inference work right at uh, uh, right in, a, in a, an industrial setting where you're monitoring the effectiveness of a machine. Um, you don't want to send all the video back over the cloud. So you're going to have, um, you know, Intel showed me a chip they're working on where they're just looking through a camera at a parking lot, not just a little parking lot, but an enormous parking lot. And the only data that's going to go back, that's going to be detected by the inference engine is is when they see movement of a pedestrian in a parking lot, right? So it won't be a car, it'll be the person. So they can monitor who's going um, from the car to the building, but then they can also monitor, or they could even set up a, you know, a script that says, no, only look at people moving from car to car, right? You can see how they're kind of cutting down the data stream. Uh, it just strikes me, though, that that processing, just that inference processing, must be very energy, uh, very energy dependent. Um, am I am I wrong? I mean, Brad, uh, how, how 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 efficient is your inter, is your inference engine? Well, I mean, it depends on you know the number of layers and and uh, you know what you put into it. But at the end of the day, that it's much more efficient to use, um, you know, the actual um, data from from the inference at the edge than trying to do it, send it all to the cloud. And what we're finding is that um, yes, there's a trade-off, but you know, you do all your all your processing of the of the data offline, obviously, to to build your um, to build your your engine um, and to you know get get those results, and we just you know extract those and put them onto the edge device, and you know that's where you're saving all the you know all that compute power was was to take the raw data and figure out what the important pieces were as part of the <clears throat> as part of the um, uh, the data you know the data reduction that you get out of uh, using an inference engine. Well, I guess the, the real question I had was, is the inference computational power, is that is that even a significant part of the total power that's consumed or it, is, it, is it a very minor part? Well, the, the nice thing is, is that, you know, we can do it in chunks. Um, okay. So we don't have to, we we can store a bit of data up and do a little do some processing store up some data do some processing that helps quite a bit so it's it's not a significant it's a significant part of the overall uh, processing but the sensors themselves uh, tend to outweigh just turning all the sensors on and having them sending data um, they tend to outweigh um, the the actual inference engine yeah that makes sense to me too I just. I just wanted to cover that because the focus of all these big companies seems to be, um, and I'm, I'm no expert, but, you know, NVIDIA, Intel, and, you know, anybody else in that space, it seems to be on this, you know, more power efficient, faster processor. Uh, I mean, I, it sounds like to me, at least at the engineering level, you know, you're not going to wait around for that to come along. <laughs> you still have to go ahead and build it. You have to build yeah, your, uh, power your application. Sorry. Is this, oh, is, is this an open discussion? Or are we going? Uh, yeah, please. No, Sorry, think... go ahead. Go ahead, Brett. I don't want to interrupt. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, processors, and we'll see, you know, over the next few years, you know, Intel's doing theirs, and NVIDIA's got their, um, you know, their architecture. But we're going to see a lot of, um, specific processors that just do inference really, really well. And it's not going to take very many uh, cycles and very much power. You know, three to five years from now, it's going to be a speck of silicon. And so you have to kind of look forward to that 
and say, okay, how can I utilize that? That's kind of what we're trying to, you know, trying to address. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Dustin. I think you were going to try to answer that. Yeah, I just, I just kind of wanted to provide some perspective um, to the, the question that you kind of uh, posed to all of us, right? But, um, you know, being, being in the embedded side and the high performance space, I think it really stems down into the workload and the application. And when I mentioned the kind of the workload, um, I think before it was kind of, you know, separate in terms of hardware and software. But I think that relationship is so symbiotic right now where it has to be so close because, and the reason why I, I mentioned this is that uh, when you talk about the workload, right, how efficient a software algorithm is written and how that software algorithm is written to basically pull from the hardware um, will really drive specifically for the application. And you pose also a good point, right? You have all these fantastic silicon jamming, you know, so many PCIe lanes into a single die, or you have multi-cores up to even 12 cores, you know, in a, in a 65 watt CPU specifically, right? But the importance there really is the, the CPU being able to deliver, you know, balancing that algorithm, software al algorithm, and being able to balance specifically uh, the workload that it's intended to, to solve uh, for that edge computing device, right? Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess what I'd like to know is where, where you think the, the future choices and trade-offs will be. Uh, I mean, uh, you guys have identified you know the big picture i think pretty well um i mean can can we wait or can we hope for much higher power bigger battery packs uh or will it be things like just less uh less power consuming sensors that are cheaper um i mean i i think it seems like to me to be a really good engineer or at least a good engineering company you have to also sort of just look two years down the road and say, you know, when my product comes to market, it's going to rely on what's available in two years. Uh, it's kind of like when, you know, they send, they, you know, they're sending satellites up into space right now that have 10 or 15 year old uh, microprocessors in them because the design curve is so long. Um, so, I mean, how, how do you kind of weigh that whole consideration? Uh, if you guys just want to jump in and answer, uh, you know, how to, how to sort of future-proof what you're working on. Uh, I, I can answer that. Um, first, first of all, um, one of my backgrounds is in uh, chemical engineering, okay? I graduated with my uh, bachelor's uh, in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley. Uh, how I got into it embedded, well, you know, that's another story. It's a long story. Okay, but anyway, I, I need to remind people uh, attending this conference and the panel that did you know that in terms of energy storage, batteries are miserable. Uh, even the most high-tech lithium smash bang battery, uh, the highest capacity lithium battery today, I can tell you this definitively as a chemical engineer, there's more energy storage in a bag of potato chips, pound for pound, than there is in the most advanced lithium cell today. Okay, if you don't believe that, you do the essentially the thermodynamic calculations, the energy storage. We've come a long way. Lithium, lithium is the lightest element. It's the lightest element. It comes after helium on, on the periodic table. That means that in terms of the uh, material, that's it. That's the best you can do with energy storage. Uh, the only other element that, because helium is inert, is hydrogen. And then everybody knows where hydrogen fuel cells are. Okay, so be that as it may, we're faced with this fundamental limitations in physics. So if you want to do low energy and all that, and uh, we, and fuel cells are going to be, you know, years if not decades away, or the, uh, the Star Wars uh, antimatter battery, never going to happen, and not, probably not in my lifetime. Then we've got to think about how do we manage the situation in the future proof our system? And the, the main thing to do is essentially lower the energy requirements from our sensors and our processors. Now we have gone a long, long ways towards lowering the energy requirements of our, of our computing power and our RAM and our other devices. Uh, there still is a fair amount of work to be done. 
with uh, things like with uh, lowering the, the energy costs for the sensors. And especially, and this is like the 800 pound gorilla in the room is uh, actuators. To drive a motor, I mean, it takes so much energy to drive a motor or any kind of actuator. And a lot of our customers want a closed loop systems where you get feedback, you're controlling something. That's never gonna go away. So uh, that's basically the challenges that we're faced with today in terms of energy. And, and in general, uh, the, the best strategies that I've found is um, uh, ones where the system, because most of the time with computing and computing architectures, the, the processor and the system is just sitting there idling, twiddling its thumb in, in real time. It's really not doing a whole lot. So these systems where like the, the Texas Instruments introduced the first one of its kind where uh, when it's sitting idle, it literally turns itself off and puts itself into a very extremely low power mode. I believe that's the future of uh, low, low energy computing and, and not low, low energy computing, let, that's a misnomer. I would say low energy handling of solutions for our customers. Uh, that's, yeah. you turn the sucker off. That's really good. I, I'm, we're There's almost a lot, out of a lot to be seen for them. Go ahead. Now, I was just going to say, we've hit that so many times where everything's about how, how long can you leave it off? You know, the whole Laura, Laura Wan, um, you know, that's its basic concept, right? Even Bluetooth LE, you know, it's, it, you can't get away from, turning things off. I mean, that's a, a huge software complexity for the bigger processors. The smaller processors just have to do it. You know, they have to do it efficiently and they have to do it more efficiently than they do today. Because it's still super complicated on any kind of applications processor to turn off all the different uh, modes. And there's like eight to 10 different uh, power states, right? So I, I agree with you completely that, you know, the power saving modes are going to are going to be a huge impact on anything that you're trying to do to keep your battery life down. Yeah. Well. Thought, yeah. I mean, this is a, such a big topic, and I'm sorry it's so big. Uh, but you know, this is one way to try to delve <laughs> into it. I, I was in a in a session with uh, TI engineers on the uh, autonomic side, and they were saying they were complaining about the sensors need to be cheaper, the processors need to be faster. Uh, it might be because they're just not doing as well as they'd like at that. That's what one other analyst said. <laughs> but uh, I, did, I do sense that it's, uh, uh, you know, pretty much kind of the state of the problem. I mean, in the, uh, yesterday, an, an automaker uh, speaking through an analyst said that they, they didn't even think 5G uh, would be fast enough for all the decisions that have to be made by future, you know, level five cars. So it's 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 pretty obvious that right at, you know we're really coming together with all of those issues uh, low power the the chemical question and you know how fast you can process uh, and so you know you have all these conflicting demands um, before you know, since we're out of time I, I do have this one question that was posed for Zolt I'm sorry if you didn't uh, if you don't have enough time to answer maybe I'll I'll, I'll let you. It says, what, this is going back to a prior uh, session. What does the timeline look like for implementing Paralene protection on devices? Um, anyway, if you can try to hit that. Thanks a lot. Sure. So um, it's, I believe it's a complex question, but uh, how fast can we apply the Paralene protection on any, any layers protecting these electronics? It depends on, on how complex the board is, how large the size of the board is. And then, of course, a lot of other other things. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are two ways of protections. One is design the protection into the board itself before the board is manufactured. And then here we can help or have the protection as an aftermarket protection. So aftermarket protections are, again, some of the the uh, all the mechanical seals or gaskets, they work, but uh, that's mostly mostly the aftermarket protection. The uh, When the protection is designed into the board, how long it takes to apply it, it, it it's actually a pretty quick process it's um, 
literally within a few hours we can protect that board but there are some steps we need to take before the protection is applied and of course after the protection is applied for example some parts of the boards do not need protection so there we need to apply some kind of masking before we apply the protection and then we have to remove that masking after so it's it's actually not a complex process it's a fully automated process especially when we do it in mass production scale so um, we have a fully automated masking line, then we do the magic with the board, we apply these, uh, these protective layers and then a fully automated demasking line. End to end, it can be several hours, but uh, since it's a batch process, uh, I would say a minute per board uh, is, is a pretty easy um, estimate. Okay, wow, thank you. Well, okay, I guess I'll have to cut it off here um, just so we can stick close to our timeline. And I really appreciate everybody's participation. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Hey, uh, great panel, a lot to unpick there. Thank you to our participants. Uh, we had a lot of questions come in that we didn't get to um, for Zolt and for James. So we will be um, fielding those questions offline. I'd like to thank all of you for attending day three of Embedded Innovation Week presented by Fierce Electronics. And we'd love to invite you to join us back here tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time for our morning session with Martin Braun, Managing Director of Risk Viewer with a session on secure connectivity in embedded devices. On behalf of Fierce Electronics, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for participating as well as all of today's sponsors. Thanks again for attending and best of luck to all of you in your design work. <laughs>